Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Washington, D.C., where we are meeting with uh, the chairman of NATO's military committee, uh, Czech Army General uh, Peter Pavel. Sir, thanks very much for uh, taking some time with us. Good morning. Um, you uh, just, just met with the reporters. You're in Washington, D.C. for a major conference on um, combating you know, more than 100 commanders uh, from 100, more than 100 different countries looking at how to combat uh, ex violent extremism around the world and terrorism. That's something that stung many of uh, many alliance members, uh, 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 many alliance members. Talk to us a little bit about what you think are the best ways, some of the views you'll be expressing, about the best ways to combat this sort of generational challenge that, that faces, uh, faces the world, not, not only the Atlantic lines. I think uh, anyone now who talks uh, from different angles on uh, terrorism, extremism, uh, uh, and uh, rightly so, because uh, uh, it creates a challenge uh, that is not only limited to individual nations uh, or you know, even alliances. Uh, it is uh, a phenomenon that affects uh, all our civilization as we know it. So uh, I believe uh, it is uh, fair uh, to say that uh, uh, since uh, terrorism and extremism uh, creates a global challenge, that uh, we uh, make uh, all efforts uh, to uh, find global response uh, to uh, this challenge. And that global response uh, is not only to be understood in a geographical sense, it means to involve uh, as much uh, uh, or as many countries as possible, but also uh, it uh, uh, should be global or comprehensive in terms of uh, toolbox. So uh, uh, it uh, has to involve uh, hard military uh, tools wherever necessary, but also soft military tools uh, in terms of uh, training, preparation, capacity building, but also many other tools uh, such as uh, um, economic development, social programs, uh, education, uh, religious discussions. All of these uh, creating uh, uh, a package uh, that uh, will provide effective uh, solutions to the phenomenon of extremism. Um, let me uh, take you to uh, the question of the Zapad uh, 17 uh, exercise. Uh, you're the first uh, person to hold this job who was actually a former Warsaw Pact uh, officer. You spent the first 10 years uh, in what was then the Czech Czechoslovakian uh, army. Um, so you have a, a very nuanced eye to looking to how Russia does things. What did you? What were the most interesting things the Russians did in Zapad 17 that you should be concerned about? And what are things maybe you should be less concerned about? I think the biggest difference that was quite striking at the first uh, sight was uh, uh, the difference between uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, narrative for the exercise and reality, uh, which was very obvious. Uh, Russia presented the uh, exercise uh, Zapad as a standard, uh, standard uh, counter-terrorism exercise. But in reality, when uh, we saw the scope uh, uh, of the exercise uh, in terms of uh, geography, running uh, from uh, uh, Northern Sea up to Black Sea, uh, from uh, tactical up to strategic level, uh, use of conventional and uh, even nuclear forces, uh, uh, all government approach, uh, uh, internal, ministerial and uh, mobilization uh, activities. So uh, all these uh, were indicating uh, to uh, something much larger, uh, that it was uh, uh, much more, more similar to the preparation of a big war against a sophisticated uh, enemy, uh, but not uh, uh, preventing uh, terrorist uh, groups uh, from entering your country. Uh, and how important you know, you, uh, you know, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was very good at active measures. How much more dangerous is Russia today, given all the social media tools and everything else that it has at its disposal? How big of a strategic threat is that from your standpoint? And what's the alliance best doing to counter it? Uh, we uh, uh, listen quite often uh, words uh, like uh, aggression uh, and, uh, and assertive behavior. Uh, I think uh, more appropriate, uh, appropriate than aggression, uh, especially uh, in relation to NATO, would be strategic uh, competition. And uh, that reflects uh, how Russia uh, sees uh, uh, the conflict, because they don't uh, see it uh, uh, as a peacetime, a crisis and war. They see a continuum of a conflict. So uh, even uh, what uh, we regard as a peacetime is uh, a different level of conflict. And that level is reflected by 
uh, information campaigns, uh, propaganda, uh, affecting uh, uh, and influencing uh, public perceptions in different countries, uh, uh, cyber attacks, uh, uh, and um, many other uh, activities that uh, are within a so-called shadow uh, gray zone. Uh, where uh, uh, Russia can uh, apply influence uh, without being seen or attributed as an aggressor. Um, let me ask you about the two new commands that are going to get uh, established. One is a logistics command that has been discussed for a long time. Um, I remember discussing this with even General Palomeros a few years ago in terms of you know, lessons learned from some of the exercises in wargaming that was going on. And then there's going to be an Atlantic and Arctic command as well, which will, uh, which will play very, very well with Norway, for example, that's been talking about that for some time. Talk to us a little bit about how these two commands are going to better equip the alliance, uh, whether it's for deterrence or God forbid, something on the more kinetic side. I think it is premature to speak about new commands right now. Uh, uh, we have uh, identified, and uh, when I say uh, we, I mean uh, now primarily uh, NATO strategic uh, commanders, both uh, Sakir and uh, uh, strategic commander for transformation based here in the United States in Norfolk. So they identified the deficiencies uh, they have uh, in uh, the structure, uh, existing structures uh, to meet uh, existing and future uh, requirements. And uh, these uh, deficiencies will uh, be addressed uh, within uh, the outline design that they, uh, they presented uh, to a uh, military committee at uh, the chief of the staff level. Uh, uh, they supported it. Now it will be presented uh, to the ministers of defense. Uh, and once uh, uh, agreed, and the agreement is expected in February 2018, uh, we will start implementing the changes. And. Uh, uh, the areas uh, you have mentioned that uh, that is uh, uh, the link between uh, North America and Europe, uh, and this uh, transatlantic communication lines uh, that are very important, uh, will be addressed as a functionality area within a new outline design. If it is uh, uh, through uh, any specific command, we will see it will be uh, one of the implementation options. The same uh, goes uh, for uh, logistics and uh, all issues related uh, to dealing with uh, home defense forces. It is quite clear uh, that uh, uh, there is a merit in uh, uh, making some distinction between uh, running the operations and uh, uh, rear area operations. But again, uh, I think it's premature uh, talking on specific commands and locations because uh, it will be a uh, subject of further discussions. I want to ask you about enhanced forward presence, but first ask you about uh, General Ben Hodges is the outgoing commander of the U.S. Army Europe has talked about the importance of a military Schengen zone for Europe. Uh, we talked to him recently. He said, you know, a lot of progress has been made over the last few years. How much more progress has to be made and how soon before you can have the kind of open borders that allow free movement of military uh, material across the alliance and also the infrastructure investment to move that, right? Some of it has been limitations on rolling stock for trains and other sorts of things. Talk to us about how long we can, before the alliance will have that uh, internal flexibility that it that it needs to be able to surge forces as necessary. I think the first stage is acknowledge that uh, there is a problem, and um, you know, we heard uh, from uh, many different uh, sources, including uh, General Hodges, who is uh, actually right uh, in uh, addressing these issues. Uh, we have identified uh, some deficiencies, and these uh, deficiencies are now being addressed. Uh, with uh, first uh, some conceptual documents, uh, like uh, uh, logistic enablement uh, of um, European uh, theater, uh, through uh, administrative uh, measures uh, with uh, individual uh, member states uh, uh, when it comes uh, to uh, authorizations to cross uh, the territory and airspace. And all of these uh, are being worked out. Uh, worked out. I think uh, we have moved uh, significantly from a uh, 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 very restrictive uh, posture that we had a half a year ago uh, up to, uh, to now, where uh, most of these restrictions uh, were lifted, and uh, now uh, uh, the freedom of mo mobility is much higher than it was before. So I think we will continue on that path, and uh, uh, both uh, in terms of logistic support as well as uh, administrative uh, measures, we are making progress. So I believe that uh, even though there is some uh, uh, impatience uh, in uh, military commanders uh, and it's justified, uh, uh, the issues are moving ahead. Um, let me ask you about the enhanced uh, uh, forward presence. Um, that's been a key priority for the alliance. Um, you just talked about Zapad and some of the capabilities that Russia demonstrated that were um, not in the counterterrorism realm but were as uh, uh, 
Gider Masian Glenskis told us, the Vice Minister of Defense from Lithuania, you know, the invasion of a NATO country is, is what his perception of that exercise was. Um, what are some of the things that are next that have to happen with the enhanced forward presence to be able to counter some of the specific things that Russia did in Zapad on the military capability side that concern you? Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking uh, on uh, uh, forward presence with different adjectives, uh, uh, one enhanced, uh, one tailored. Uh, what is important uh, that uh, under current uh, circumstances uh, with uh, uh, new uh, uh, Russian strategic uh, posturing uh, with uh, their um, defense capacity building, with uh, their new equipment and especially with uh, the rhetorics and some actions, uh, we uh, have to present a, a viable uh, option of how to uh, potentially confront uh, that situation. And it is uh, through some level of uh, forward presence, but uh, mainly uh, through other means uh, that uh, create uh, credible deterrence, and it's a reinforcement. And uh, reinforcement uh, not only in terms of uh, readiness forces, but also uh, in all other forces. And uh, it has to be also underpinned uh, by uh, thorough uh, logistic preparation, including some prepositioning of equipment, including uh, uh, these uh, restrictions on, on movement, which we, uh, we talked about, including uh, logistic support in terms of uh, transport, medical facilities, and all other aspects of logistic support. All uh, this uh, together uh, uh, and uh, accompanied uh, by a strong uh, political will uh, creates, uh, in the end, uh, efficient uh, deterrence, and that's uh, what we aim for. Uh, two quick questions, because I know I'm about to get the hook in a second. Uh, first one is, um, give us a quick update on the southern hub strategy of NATO. There are those who are particularly concerned about what's going on in the south, not just what's going on uh, in the north, and then on Afghanistan, and then I have a broader alliance cohesion question that I'd like to end with. I think uh, these two are related because uh, cohesion, uh, cohesion comes uh, from uh, let's say equal treatment of uh, threats. And uh, it is difficult to uh, distinguish uh, which uh, threat uh, is more important. They are uh, equally important, even probably uh, not equally urgent. Uh, but we have to address both. Uh, there is no luxury uh, of uh, moving them in time. And uh, uh, all nations uh, ask uh, the alliance uh, to pay attention to uh, their concerns. That's why uh, we uh, try uh, to avoid any discussion on uh, eastern or southern flank, but rather we talk about a 360 approach uh, to uh, challenges coming from all the directions. And it is reflected in a number of activities, uh, uh, especially uh, when uh, we talk about uh, um, the southern, uh, southern uh, part of the alliance and the southern challenges uh, coming mostly from uh, northern Africa and Middle East. Uh, uh, there is a number of uh, activities, including a framework for the South, a uh, newly established hub uh, for the South within uh, the Joint Force Command in Naples, a uh, counterterrorism plan, projecting stability initiative, defense capacity building in a number of countries in the region. So, um, uh, altogether, I believe uh, that uh, there is a very broad spectrum of uh, activities uh, being taken uh, to address uh, the challenges uh, from wherever they come, including the southern ones. Um, Afghanistan strategy, are you satisfied with what that is? And is the alliance going to make available more combat troops for the U.S. mission there? Or, or, or what the, the, the new U.S. strategy there? Uh, for me, uh, first, uh, let me clarify that uh, NATO doesn't have a combat mission in Afghanistan, and that hasn't changed with the new uh, American strategy for uh, the region. Uh, NATO uh, has a training, assist, and advice mission, and we will continue to support uh, this, uh, this mission. Uh, nations of the alliance uh, are ready uh, to uh, follow the call uh, for increase of personnel. Uh, we just uh, had uh, yesterday a force generation conference uh, in shape uh, that uh, was uh, to generate more forces uh, for existing resolute support mission. And we'll see uh, uh, the results. I, I still haven't received them, but I believe that uh, nations will be very close uh, to uh, the requirements set by the mission commander. Um, and let me ask you one last question, which is a, a unity cohesion um, question. Um, you know, the American president has been very candid of the, the, his concern that there are freeloaders in the alliance, basically, who are not doing their part and they should spend more money. The counterpoint for some of those nations is we're doing the best we can given our financial uh, constraints, given that the Eurozone countries, for example, are debt limited, which is something the United States is, is less debt limited. Um, are you concerned that uh, some of the rhetoric has undermined the cohesion of the alliance, especially when it comes to the transatlantic link, where 
you know, there are frustrations on, on both sides. The president's been clear about it. European leaders have privately been, and, and some publicly been concerned uh, about some of the rhetoric coming out of Washington. Given that both of these, uh, you know, the alliance really needs all part of it to function, um, you know, how is the quality of that cohesion from your standpoint at this point? We have a different uh, ways uh, how to uh, pass uh, the message. Uh, it can be a very uh, well-polished political diplomatic message or it uh, can be uh, blunt. But uh, the effect is uh, the same. We all understand uh, that uh, there was and is uh, imbalance in uh, burden sharing. And uh, all the nations are aware of that imbalance and are willing uh, to uh, take serious steps uh, to correct it. Uh, we can see uh, the improvement uh, in uh, defense spending in the vast majority of NATO, uh, NATO members. Uh, we can see that uh, they uh, have taken seriously uh, their uh, commitment to the alliance by uh, accepting uh, all capability targets. Um, it is the uh, first time in uh, the process of NATO defense planning. We can see it in increased uh, contributions by nations to uh, missions, operations, uh, and activities of the alliance. So overall, I, I believe that uh, uh, there is a coherent, uh, coherent, uh, cohesion within uh, the alliance and that nations are doing uh, their best. However, uh, probably not all of them uh, will be able to uh, meet uh, uh, the threshold of uh, 2%. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, once uh, nations uh, present their national plans, uh, uh, by uh, February next year, we'll have a clearer view uh, where uh, are still gaps and uh, where we'll have to uh, uh, put more attention. Is there a concern that you have that the amount is, uh, that there's too much focus on the amount, that more that should be just about capability deliver? Because there are some countries that say, hey, we're delivering capability, it's not only about the amount. It is natural uh, focus of, of military uh, uh, figure, 2% uh, um, is a political indicator, and I think it is important. But for military, and especially for uh, military in commanding positions like uh, Sakir, uh, he will probably not ask uh, nations uh, to uh, what percent uh, they meet uh, defense spending, but uh, how many troops they deliver, uh, how many ships, aircraft, and at what time. Uh, this is what matters for military commanders. So uh, we have to focus on both. On one hand on defense spending that will allow building sufficient capabilities. Uh, General Peter Pavel, uh, command, uh, chairman of the NATO Military Committee, sir, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.